Hello, this is Kyler Wirth of AAII. We are talking about the latest and greatest from the world of finance and investing for the individual investor. We're broadcasting, and if you're watching this in the archive, we post our upcoming live show schedule on aaii.com slash webinars. And AAII members will have access to the full archive of shows. Our guests today are Charles Rotblut and Derek Hageman. Today's show has three topics. How the individual investor can make use of the Pytrotsky high F-score strategy. In this segment, we will run down the criteria and grading method of Pytrotsky's system, as well as how to make investments based off that criteria. Next, we reveal the first cut list for lower risk high yield mutual funds and ETFs. Finally, we run down the guidelines for selecting mutual funds and ETFs based on PRISM's four steps for the wealth building process. Let's get started. Today, I'm joined by Derek Hageman, financial writer for AAII and the editor for the Dividend Investing Service for AAII. How are you doing today, Derek? Hey, Kyler. How's it going? I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Great to have you here. So the Pytrotsky Financial Scoring System is a method created by accounting professor Joseph, Joseph Pytrotsky to measure whether or not a low, a low share stock was a winner or loser based on a certain set of criteria. This system has taken off in, in popularity, and in the past few decades, the Pytrotsky High F-score approach has significantly outperformed the S&P index. What are the aspects of the F-score approach that have allowed it to perform better, and do you think this trend will last? Well, Kyler, uh, you are correct. The, the Piotrowski financial scoring system, it has grown into a, a popular approach to identify companies that have solid and improving financials. And as you mentioned, the, the approach has outperformed the S&P 500 index by a wide margin. Um, since the beginning of 1998, uh, it has generated a compound annual price gain of 17.2% over the period from January 1998 through June 30th, 2021, while the S&P 500 is up, uh, I think it's up 6.5% annually over the same period. And for 2021 through, through June 30th, the Piotrowski approach has returned 36.2%, while the S&P has generated 14.5%. So AAII's Piotrowski high F-score strategy, like you mentioned, it explores stocks with low share prices relative to their book value to see if it is possible to establish basic financial criteria to separate the winners from the losers. And our Piotrowski high F-score screen, it segments firms by financial strength, and it's helpful in identifying both potentially attractive stocks as well as companies to avoid. And generally, portfolios comprising stocks with high F-scores outperform uh, those with lower F-scores. So Piotrowski's financial scoring system, again, we call it the, the F-score, it uses nine criteria that he divided into broad categories. And those broad categories are profitability, capital structure, that is uh, looking at leverage, uh, liquidity and sources of funds, and third, operating efficiency. So Piotrowski, he then scored each criterion with a zero or a one, depending on a company's underlying financials. And together, the, the nine criteria make up a composite F-score that has a maximum score of nine, and the higher the score, the better. So in his, in his study, Piotrowski compared the performance of winners, and he defines winners as a score of eight or nine, and losers uh, a score of zero or one. And he found that the winners outperformed the losers over the following year, and stocks with a, a low price relative to, to their book value make up the starting universe of Piotrowski. And measures such as, as price to book ratio, they help to identify which stocks may be truly undervalued and neglected 
And uh, the, the price to book ratio, it's determined by dividing the market price per share by book value per share. And uh, book value is generally determined by subtracting total liabilities from total assets and then dividing by the number of shares outstanding. And just a couple more points. So if, if accounting measures truly capture the value of a stock, then the stock should trade at a price near its accounting book value. However, this, this is typically not the case and companies have some leeway when implementing accounting principles. So Piotrowski, he first limited the universe to the bottom 20% of stocks according to their price to book uh, value ratio. And this is our first screening criteria. So the aspects of the F score approach that have allowed it to perform better are the price to book value ratio combined with broad categories like profitability, capital structure, and operating efficiency. The Pio Trotsky high F score approach scores stocks from zero to nine and puts these points, and these points are awarded based on a certain set of criteria, as you mentioned, minimum profitability, capital structure, and operating efficiency. Since minimum profitability makes up four of the nine possible points to score, is it fair to say that it is the most important factor when, look, when choosing a stock? Well, Kyler, I'm, I'm not prepared to say that minimum profitability is the most important category to look at. Uh, they, they all are equally important, uh, but let's look at the criteria that make up the minimum profitability category. Uh, Piotrowski, he awarded up to four points for profitability. Uh, one for positive return on assets, one for positive cash flow from operations, uh, one point for an improvement in return on assets over the last year, and finally one point if cash flow from operations exceeds net income. Uh, these, are, these are simple tests that are easy to measure. And let's just look at a, a couple of them in just a little more detail. Return on assets examines the return generated by the assets of the firm. And return on assets is uh, the net income divided by total assets. And a high return on assets implies that, implies that the assets are productive and well-managed. Operating cash flow is reported on the statement of cash flows and is designed to measure a company's ability to generate cash from day-to-day -day operations as it provides goods and services to its customers. The final metric in the profitability section of the F-score calculation addresses the relationship between earnings and cash flow levels, uh, accruals, and Piotrowski seeks companies with cash, cash flow from operations that is greater than net income before extraordinary items. And the measure tries to avoid firms making accounting adjustments to earnings in the short run that may weaken long-term profitability. The list of criteria set by the F-score seems to search for companies that have little risk of closing and are on upward trend. Based on its own set of criteria, is the F-score system more valuable for short-term purchases or long-term investments? Or is that up for the individual investor to decide? Well, while the market does a good job of valuing securities in the long run, uh, in the short run, it can overreact to information and push prices away from their true value. But let, let's recall that P. of Trotsky compared the performance of winners, again, a score of eight or nine, and losers, a score of zero or one. He found that the winners outperformed the losers over the following year. Now, with that, with that said, we talked about the strategy's performance earlier. The Piotrowski screen has been one of AAII's top performing screens over the long term, but there has been a great deal of vari variability from year to year. But since 1998, the strategy has outperformed the S&P 500 by a wide margin. Of the 11 companies that met Piotrowski's high F-score criteria, all 11 reached an F-score of eight out of nine. How rare is it that a company scores a nine and how should the individual investor view a company that scores a nine comparatively to a seven or eight? 
Is that a no-brain purchase or is there more variables to consider? Well, that is correct. Of the of the 11 companies that uh, meet the Piotrowski high F-score criteria, all 11 reached an F-score of eight out of nine. Um, scores of nine are rare, but but as I've looked at them over the last few years, there are a handful of companies every quarter that score a nine out of nine. Now, I haven't tracked the strategy's history going back to 1998 but I'm confident that this general trend holds. Um, and of course, there is some variability depending on, uh, depending on the market, if, if we're in a bull or a bear market. Now you asked, uh, how should an individual investor view a company that scores a nine compared to one that scores a seven or eight? Well, generally, the higher the F score, the greater the average portfolio return. The P of Trotsky financial scoring system, I mean, it really helps form a fundamental framework to further analyze a company that looks to reward investors willing to take the time to do some basic homework. So Kyler, I, I would like to finish with this. P of Trotsky's work consisted of creating low price to book portfolios and further segmenting them in varying portfolios of financial strength. Now, overall, the higher the financial score, the greater the average portfolio return. And of course, results of individual stocks will vary dramatically. But even with these additional financial tests, it is important to perform a careful analysis of any passing stocks. Well, um, thank you, Derek. You can find his article, uh, Separating Winners from Losers, Piotrowski's low price to book stocks and many others like it in the July Journal at AAII.com. Once again, thank you so much, Derek, for your time. Thanks, Kyler. Today, I am joined by Charles Rockwell. The latest First Cuts identifies lower risk, high yielding mutual funds and ETFs have just come out. And that is what I'd like to talk to you about today. First, let's go over mutual fund first cut list. Avoiding a significant loss of capital is a priority for many individual investors. What are some examples of risks that come with reaching for yield? So one of the big issues with, re with reaching for yield is that higher yields are often a sign of higher risk. So when you look at a stock or even a bond and the yields higher, usually that means that investors are concerned there's some problem with the company's financials. So for a stock, if there's a higher yield, it may mean that investors are concerned that current dividend is not sustainable, uh, it might have to be cut, it might have to be suspended. If we flip it to bonds, it means that investors are concerned the company may not be able to make its interest rates payments. Now, a higher yield can be a sign of a lower valuation, perhaps meaning that that assessment of risk is misplaced simply because the company's business is in a temporary decline, but it's fundamentally sound enough to actually pay its dividend and perhaps grow its dividend. So sometimes valuation low, sometimes high yield can be a sign of opportune times to buy a company, but it always does reflect that perception that there is some risk involved. And part of the art of investing is being able to tell when that assessment of risk is correct and when it's misplaced. On the list of 25 mutual funds that pass the first cut screen, a significant percentage of them fall into the large value category. Is there any reason behind this trend and is it indicative of large value funds generally having less risk than those in other categories? The value stocks tend to pay dividends more frequently than the, than the growth stocks. And if we look at the universe of stocks, it is the value-based companies are paying higher yields. So for growth stocks, some do pay dividends, but generally you see the prices being bid up. So even if they're paying dividends because their share prices might be higher, you'll see a lower yield. But you also see a lot of growth stocks spending a lot of their capital reinvesting in themselves. So if a company has a choice between paying a dividend and reinvesting its earnings, and if reinvesting its earnings is going to lead to more business opportunities and greater profits, there is a financial argument to be made for doing that reinvestment, but that will also cause 
the growth stock to have a lower dividend or not paying dividends at all. So what we tend to see is value stocks by and large tend to pay more dividends. And because higher yields are associated with lower valuations, you tend to see the higher yielding mutual funds on the stock side be more associated with value stocks. Now, as we show in the first cut, not every fund passing is a large cap value fund, but the majority appearing on the list are large cap value funds. One fund that stands out above the rest is Shelton Equity Income Direct Shares. With a 7.0% yield and a risk index of 0.73, there's a clear distinction between this fund and the rest that made the cut. With that kind of numbers, it would seem enticing to income-seeking investors. That being said, is it worth the individual investor analyzing the potential loss of capital gains, even for a fund as attractive as this one? Yes, certainly income-seeking investors will probably look at that 7% yield and find it very enticing, especially now uh, when you're looking at the yield in the S&P 500 being below 2%. Uh, but anytime you see a yield that seems unusually high, it's an immediate sign to stop and ask yourself, why is this yield so high? So in this case for Shelton, they use covered call strategies. So they, on their underlying portfolio of stocks, they're selling call contracts, basically contracts to allow another the buyer of that contract to buy the stock at a certain price. So if the stock's stay trading at 25, they sell a call option at 30. If that stock goes up to say $32 before the contract expires, the buyer of the contract can, can exercise it and buy the stock for $25. Now, in this case, if the stock stays below $30, Shelton gets to keep the proceeds from the premiums of the covered call contract. So it gives Shelton more income, which it can pass on to investors. A consideration for investors, however, is the tax cost ratio. So for the last year, Shelton has a tax cost ratio of 5.7%, which means investors in this fund in the highest income tax bracket lost about 5.7% of their assets per share to taxes. So in other words, they gave up a lot in returns to taxes. So this is a strategy that can give more income, but it does come with that tax cost ratio. It can also, covered calls can also tend to limit gains because if a stock rises too much, the fund, in this case, the fund's forced to sell the stock at a price lower than what its quoted price is. So yes, you're getting more income, but there's caveats and you have to make sure you understand those caveats, make sure you're comfortable, but also consider the tax issue. And in this case, if a fund's not very tax efficient, uh, investors should consider whether or not they're able to locate it into say an IRA or Roth IRA where the tax cost issue will not be a concern. Now on to ETFs. Comparatively to mutual funds, the top ETF yield percentages are only half of that of the top mutual fund yield percentage. What difference between mutual funds and ETFs could have caused this? Well, the big thing is really the inclusion of the Shelton fund in the mutual fund selection. So that fund, such as the high yield, it skew the results higher. Uh, it does appear there's some covered called ETFs, none past our screen, um, and it probably has to deal with the design of those ETFs and the volatility of those ETFs, and also, how new they are. So it's not so much that you can get higher yields through mutual funds and ETFs. It's really just the design of the funds, uh, the maturity of both, and really just how they run. If you look at a lot of the, the dividend paying mutual funds, or say the mutual funds with higher yields versus the ETFs with higher yields, there isn't huge differences in daylight, but there are some at the extremes. In this case, we have that Shelton that really skews upwards the yields we're seeing for the dividend paying mutual funds. Since ETFs are required to have at least 100 million in assets and 10,000 in daily shares to make the cut, this sets a precedent that only bigger ETFs are worth looking at. Is there any concern that smaller ETFs could be a successful investment and are overlooked or is the risk closure too great to consider looking at them? That's a great question, Kyler. Uh, there's two reasons why we place those constraints. So the first one is $100 million. Uh, to use a baseball terminology, it's a Mendoza line. So ETFs whose assets under management 
AUM are $100 million or less tend to be at higher risk of closing. Now, it's not a set number in the sand, or a set stone, I should say, in cement, but it is a line that most people perceive as a break point between which ETFs can survive and which can't. And it really has to do with efficiencies. ETFs and even mutual funds need a certain level of assets to be able to operate profitable, operate a profit. Now, in terms of trading volume, when we set the number at 10,000, it's an arbitrary number, but we were but what we were trying to do is establish a number at which individual investors can buy or sell shares of the ETF without moving the price. So mutual funds are bought at the end of the day based at the end of the day net asset value. ETFs are traded in a day like stocks. So when you buy an ETF, you could potentially move its price if your order is large enough relative to the number of shares of the ETF traded at that point. So by requiring a minimum level of volume, we lessen the chance that an investor trying to purchase an ETF will move the price and also increase the odds that they'll be able to buy the ETF relatively quickly at those quoted prices. On the list of ETFs that pass the first cut, what is more significant to the individual investor? To look at yield percentage or category risk index, or does this depend on the investing strategy of the investor? You know, it does depend on investors' preferences. Uh, people who are desiring higher levels of portfolio income will look at the yield. Uh, those who are more concerned about trying to reduce portfolio volatility will look at the category risk and realize the category risk index compares the risk of the ETF to its peers. The total risk index, which we have available in our ETF guide, measures the volatility of that ETF to the full universe of ETFs. So I want to make that distinction. But I think in either case, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at ETF or mutual fund, you want to look beyond those two characteristics. You want to look at returns over a period of several years, see whether or not it's been better than a, than a fund's category peers or if it's been worse, um, if there's been big changes up or down. Uh, you want to always look at the expense ratio. If you're holding an ETF or a mutual fund in a taxable account, look at the tax cost ratio. And while most ETFs tend to be tax efficient, not all are, but I'd also encourage investors to go to the ETF sponsors or the mutual fund sponsors website and read the materials. Look at the fact sheet, look at the prospectus, make sure you understand what the mutual fund or ETF is designed to do, what their investment strategy is, and even look at how their portfolio is constructed, how much is allocated to the largest investments versus all investments. Because even though it sounds tempting to just judge a fund by its cover, you really cannot judge an ETF or a mutual fund by name alone. You really need to look and see what exact strategy a mutual fund or ETF is following because even similarly named funds can have different strategies. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, you can find his articles First Cuts identifies lower risk, higher yielding mutual funds, and First Cuts identifies lower risk, higher yielding ETFs in the July Journal at AAII.com. Welcome back, Charles. Today, I'd like to go over the guidelines for selecting mutual funds and ETFs after both First Cut lists have just passed. The two examples of hypothetical investors presented in the article involve Elizabeth, a young investor, and Jane and Bob, a retired couple. These scenarios depict a vastly different set of circumstances. How does the PRISM model help adapt uh, investors with drastically different situations? Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. So PRISM, our wealth building process, starts with identifying an investor's goal. So we want investors to think about why am I investing because that really establishes everything else. Uh, if you have a shorter term time horizon, that means you're going to take a more conservative allocation and you'll probably consider more conservative mutual funds or ETFs. Uh, if you're younger and perhaps you're looking at a lengthy investment period spanning decades, you'll be more aggressive. And the reason why that matters in terms of selecting ETFs and mutual funds is that there's approximately 25,000 mutual funds. Uh, there's close to 2,500 ETFs. 
And so if you're going to go into that universe with absolutely no clear plan for how you're going to invest, it can be very daunting to figure out, well, what fund am I going to look at? But if you use the, the PRISM process, where you're identifying your goals, then you're considering your risk tolerance, your asset allocation, and then your preferences, suddenly you've taken this huge universe of funds and you're really narrowing it down, whether it's mutual funds or ETFs, to funds that fit specific needs for your portfolio allocation. So we follow a top-down approach. We still think it's important to find very good ETFs and very good mutual funds, but we want you to look within the confinements I really shouldn't say confinements, but really in terms of your needs. What portfolio need are you trying to fill? And if you understand that, and then you understand what your preferences are, you suddenly can take this large universe and narrow it down. So perhaps you need small cap and you have a preference for value. All of a sudden, you're not worried about these thousands and thousands of mutual funds, or all these you know, 2,500 ETFs. You're really narrowing it down to the, just a small group that focuses on small cap value. And suddenly the work you need, to, you need to do to analyze the fund and pick the one that's correct for you suddenly gets reduced by a really massive amount. And it's a huge time saver. But again, it also helps you achieve your goals. Context plays a massive role in choosing a fund, especially the context of how well, how well it performs compared to other mutual funds in its field. So how much do historical and global context play into the decision to choose a fund? Are those good indicators for how well a fund will perform in the future? You know, I think it's good, and I think it's really important to do those peer-to-peer -peer comparisons. So they take two very different funds. Say you take an emerging market stock fund, and you're comparing it to a large cap growth fund in the U.S. They're going to be affected by different things. Uh, the things that, say, are affecting Google in the U.S., the large internet company, versus the things that are perhaps affecting Petrobras, the large oil company out of Brazil, completely different characteristics. So when you're looking at funds, you really want to compare it to its peers because what's affecting fund performance in one category or one fund group may be different than what's affecting the performance of a fund in another group. And it also comes down to this idea of allocation. So you're trying to have funds or really assets with different characteristics in your portfolio to smooth out volatility and to really help you achieve your goals. So in this case, you want to really do that peer-to-peer -peer comparison. If you need an emerging markets fund, for instance, you want to see how that's compared to other emerging markets. Have Over the long term, has it tended to outperform its peers or underperform its peers? If you're looking for large cap growth, you want to compare it to other large cap growth. So the idea is use your asset allocation to figure out what category of mutual funds you're looking at, what type of asset class you're looking at. And then within those groups, then do the peer-to-peer -peer comparisons to find the best ETF or mutual fund for that allocation need you have. Both passive and active funds come with their own set of pros and cons. So when building a portfolio, should an individual investor incorporate both kinds of funds or should they focus on one specific approach? Yeah, it really depends on your investing process, your, excuse me, on your investing pro, um, preference. And we talk about this in the PRISM method about identifying your risk tolerance and your and your preferences. So if you're a person who's just a die in the wool Jack Bogle fan, you strongly believe in index funds, then you should focus on index funds. You should tune everything else out. Um, if you're someone who believes active managers have an edge, have the ability to pick better, pick securities better and can beat an index over the long term, then go with active investing. Now, some people are in the middle where they really just want the best performing fund. And if that's the case, you're a blend approach where you're willing to consider active or passive, that expands the universe of funds or ETFs available to you to choose from. But it really comes down to your preference. Uh, we know over the long term that index funds are hard to beat. But when you look at the long term data, there are actively managed funds that have beat them. Uh, the challenge, of course, is identifying the active managers now who are going to outperform index funds in the future. So it's not impossible to beat an index fund, but it is hard to pick the, the active managers the active managers that are capable of beating the index funds and will beat the index funds in the future. So again, it really comes down to preference and how much you believe 
an, an actively an active manager and actively managed fund is going to beat the index fund in the future and how much you're willing to accept having active management in your portfolio versus following a pure index approach. The article lists six key characteristics to look for in mutual funds and ETFs. Of the six, category risks, expenses, fund type, interest rate sensitivity, R squared, and returns, are there any more significant than the other, or is that up to the individual investor to decide? You know, I think they're all important because they kind of, they form a comprehensive picture of the portfolio. When we look at some of those, the tax cost ratio, for instance, really depends on where you're locating the mutual fund or ETF. So when we say locating, I'm referring to asset location, which is which type of account are you holding the asset in? So if you're looking at, say, a fund investment, real estate investment trust, they're not very tax efficient because of how real estate investment trust REITs distributions are taxed. So you want to make sure you allocate those to an IRA or a Roth IRA. So those types of considerations may play a role, uh, but if taxes aren't a consideration for you, do not have to consider it. Uh, the R squared plays a role if you're looking at active funds because you're trying to see how close an active manager is in terms of following the S&P 500. Lower R squareds tend to signify more active approaches. So those things matter right there. But then when you look at things like category perfor category performance, that really plays across the board uh, where you're evaluating the fund. So, but I do think it's important to consider all those things because even a high tax cost ratio, even if it's not a concern to you in terms of the tax cost, it may give you a sense for how often the fund manager is taking gains, how quickly the turnover is, which could which could lead to more volatility and higher expenses. So, we do advocate for taking a lot, really a bigger viewpoint of the mutual fund, doing a little extra research, kicking both the front and back tires, so to speak, to make sure the fund is what you think it is and it's the right fund for you. And it's not that much more time you're spending on doing research, but certainly can help your investment process. Once again, thank you, Charles. You can find his article, Guidelines for Selecting Mutual Funds and ETFs, and others like it in the July Journal at AAII.com. Have a great day. Thanks, Kyler. You too. Hi, all. If you weren't aware, we record this show in advance of the broadcast date, and we do like to answer questions in our listener mailbag segment. We didn't receive any questions for this episode of the show in advance, and so I just wanted to remind our viewers and listeners you can do so. If you have any questions for us for a future episode or on anything you have read or seen from AAII content, please send an email to kworf at aaii.com with the subject line, I.I. Show Question. We will try to get it on air for the next episode. And now a word from our friends at Discover Bank, sponsor of the Individual Investor Show and AAII webinars. We know as individuals in interested in building investor wealth, you never want your money to be idle. Even small dollar amounts for short amounts of time should be working for you. With that, we're pleased to share information from our partner, Discover Bank, on deposit accounts that keep your money moving. You can choose from several options to help you meet your short-term or long-term financial goals. The best part? All of the deposit accounts offer preferred member rates. Please take a look.
If you liked our show, please visit AAII.com slash webinars to register for more webinar and video content. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at AAII underscore invest underscore ED. For more investing education, check out our website, www.aai.com. I want to thank our guests, Derek Hageman and Charles Rutblett, and you for listening. See you next time.